All right, let's get started. <laughs> Static stability and dynamic stability. Now, listen. Static, static stability has just one answer. It says, is it stable or unstable? Okay, yes or no? Is it stable? Yes. Is it unstable? No. So that's the all. That's 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 all you're gonna get. But st stability doesn't mean anything if the airplane goes back to the equilibrium point in three years. Well, it goes back to the th if it comes back in three years to the equilibrium point, uh, mathematically, there's no such airplane. But if it if it takes three years to come back to the equilibrium point we would still call it a stable airplane, right? Does it mean anything that it takes so long? It doesn't mean anything. My question is, how long does it take to come back to the equilibrium point? Ah, now we are talking dynamic stability. Everything that is related, that has a, that has a question that is related to time, how long does it take to come back? How much time will it take to half the signal? What is the, t what is the period? Right? Does it come back with an oscillation? Or does it come back directly? Oh, it comes back with an oscillation. Okay, what is the period of the oscillation? Is it half a second? So you're going back like this? Or you're going back like that? Right? These are questions that we ask in terms of dynamic stability, in, 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 the, in, the, in the framework of dynamic stability. So, saying that an airplane is unstable doesn't really mean much, that's what I'm trying to say. Or, the opposite is also true. I have made an airplane that is statically stable. Good. How long does it take to come back to the equilibrium point? Right? One second, five seconds, two minutes, five, sec five minutes, five hours? 100 years? Tell me about dynamic stability. How fast? How much oscillations do you, do you do? How much oscillations do you have before you come back to the equilibrium point? Generally, when people say they made a stable airplane, they usually mean an airplane that is statically stable, but also has nice dynamic stability characteristics. Okay? So it comes back to the equilibrium point in a nice way. It won't take a really long time. Again, the same thing if something is unstable. We, may, we have an airplane that's unstable. Okay, good. How unstable? What do you mean? It doubles the signal in five years. It's pr practically not moving in two hours, right? That doesn't mean anything. If the signal doubles in a really long time. The signal doubles in two hours. Let's make it a little more meaningful. The signal doubles in two hours. So what does it mean? Well, it doubles in two hours, which means I can practically fly 20, 30 minutes without even feeling the instability. Is it statically unstable? Yes. It doesn't mean anything. How unstable are we talking about here? Okay. So tell me about dynamic instability. How long does it take to double? If it doubles in a half a second, now, well, now I'm in trouble because I wait three seconds, we are already out, right? But if it doubles in one hour, it doesn't mean anything. The pilot will just take it back. Understand? So dynamic stability is just as important as static stability. Okay, I just want you to feel that because I know a lot of times people always want to have a stable airplane and then they say, uh, we made something really, uh, we made a stable, air, a statically stable airplane. Okay, so what does it mean? F-16 is statically unstable. Okay, so what? I mean, wh what do we exactly mean by that? Right? We mean it's, uh, the F-16 has trim points that are statically unstable, good, but what are the dynamics, what are the dynamic stability characteristics? I mean, how unstable are we talking about here? Okay? There are many airplanes where the, where the spiral mode is unstable. Here. That spiral mode here, okay? This here is the spiral mode. 
This is the Dutch roll. And this here is the roll mode. Okay? And someone was asking me, how do we decide on the names here? This is how we decide on the names, because most of the airplanes will have that characteristic. You will have one route that is close to the imaginary side and one route that is very far away, and then you have an oscillation somewhere here. That oscillation, we call it a dash roll. Now, let's say you designed an airplane, you did something, you, you whatever, and you have all the variables to calculate these A matrices, and you calculate, and you don't see this in your lateral dynamics. What will you say? I don't know. I, I'm just going to tell you, you designed a, a, an airplane that is not conventional. I mean, either there's something wrong with the airplane, or you made your calculations wrong, because a typical airplane that looks like a, a typical fixed wing, most of the fixed wings that fly at least, they have this characteristic. One is close to the imaginary, one is far away, and one is in, in the middle. So we call this a roll, this one, the roll mode, spiral mode, and the dash roll mode. That's how I decide on these modes. Okay? As I said, if it doesn't look like this, then maybe it's not a conventional airplane then. You see what I'm saying? Okay, so what I'm trying to say is that the spiral mode, there are a lot of airplanes where the spiral mode is actually unstable, it's on this side. Okay? So are these airplanes statically unstable? Um, yes, the spiral mode is unstable. This is a big problem. Well, not really, because if it's on this side, then still the doubling time will be very uh, the doubling time will be very long, so it will take a long time to double. The pilot will just take it, take it to the other side and it will start continue flying, right? So the dynamic stability is kind of what drives this thing. So same thing with the, with the uh, longitudinal dynamics, right? The slow one here, we would call the phigoid mode. And the fast complex conjugate, we would call the, the short period mode. Okay? That's how we decide on this. So if I would give you another airplane, numbers for another airplane, in order for you to generate this A matrix, you can generate the A matrix, look at these numbers, hopefully find these eigenvalues and say this is the figure, this is the short period. And then calculate the periods and the halving times and all these things. So what happens to the airplane when you, when you enter a gust or a wind? What happens to an airplane if you enter a gust or have a disturbance? Obviously the airplane, yes, we disconnected the lateral with the longitudinal, but in real life, I mean, they exist together, right? They don't affect each other too much, but they exist together. So what happens to an airplane that flies in the air and you give it a good gust or a good disturbance? Well, all of these things that we just talked about, both in the lateral and the longitudinal, they all happen together at once. So you have the Dutch roll a little bit, you have the figoid, you have the short period, and then you have the, the roll mode, and then you have the spiral on top. You add everything together, that's what happens to the airplane. But remember, we are still looking at the linear system, right? The A matrix is still a linearization of the nonlinear system, which is only true around the equilibrium point. We are not looking at the full nonlinear system, right? So when I say it's a combination of all these three, yes, I mean it is a combination of them, but in the long run there might be nonlinear aerodynamic effects that are not even here. So the real behavior might not be this linear system. This is really true around the equilibrium point. If you're too far from the equilibrium point, it's not really true anymore, right? It is still a linearization around the equilibrium point. Is that clear? I never forget that. I mean, we are looking at the equilibrium point, but looking from looking using the nonlinear system. And we have seen at the beginning of the class that whatever happens 
for an equilibrium point of the linear system, the, 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 the characteristic of the equilibrium point of the linear system, the nonlinear system's equilibrium point has also the same characteristics in terms of stability and dynamic stability. But if you're too far away from the, tri from this, from the trim point, it's not necessarily the same behavior. But most of the time it's similar. Fixed wing airplanes are quite linear in, in many ways. I mean, think of the CL alpha graph, right? Look at the CL alpha graph. The CL alpha looks what? You know, we have the CL alpha graph and CL alpha looks something like that, right? Very typical. So for the most part, this is actually linear. So you can put a line here, right? Unless you're in stall, airplanes have a pretty linear behavior. That's why they are simple to fly and it's, they're rather simple to analyze. But if you go to, <laughs> um, say, helicopters, right? Helicopters are a lot more complex. There's a lot of nonlinearity in helicopters because of the rotor and the, and the complex aerodynamics. And suddenly none of these things will hold anymore, right? Especially in slow speeds. So you, then you have nonlinearity. Then you have to be really careful when you linearize a helicopter. Then when you're a little bit away from the trim point, suddenly that linear model is not valid anymore. Okay? So does it make any sense? Uh, any questions? Okay, so the next thing I quickly want to uh, finish today and look at is, um, I, I told you we need to look at the eigenvalues, uh, eigenvectors to see which one is really oscillating a lot, okay? Uh, the eigenvectors we need to look at. Um, all modes that were found don't tell us which states actually show that behavior. What I'm trying to say is that if something oscillates, right, the mode is, it's, it has oscillation, okay, but which state is oscillating? Are all four of them oscillating or one of them or two of them? If all four of them are oscillating, which one is oscillating more? Right? You see what I'm saying? In the Figoid mode, we said, oh, there's oscillation here and there's oscillation here in the short period mode. Good, but which states? Are all of them oscillating at the same time or what? So in order to look at that, we like to look at uh, the eigenvectors. For that, for that, we look at the eigenvectors. Okay. So the eigenvectors kind of give me this, right? If you have a two-dimensional system, let's say x1 and x2, right? And let's say you have um, an, an, an eigenvector that looks like that, okay? And that eigenvector has, uh, and this is let's say for a two-dimensional system, right? x1 and x2. It's a two-dimensional system, x1, x2. And let's say you did the A matrix, you find the eigenvalues, and you find two eigenvalues and two eigenvectors, right? So you have that eigenvector here. And then let's say the second eigenvector looks like that. So this is one. I, this is associated with one uh, eigenvalue, and this is associated with another eigenvalue. Okay. So in broad sense, you know, I, I, I'm not trying to be very accurate here, but just in a broad sense, you can say that. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Let's call this eigenvalue two. Right. You have eigenvalue one, eigenvalue two. Each eigenvalue is associated with an eigenvector. Now you can look at this eigenvalue, the eigenvalue just tells you whatever it tells, right? W what we have found previously. But if you look at the eigenvector, it can tell you a little bit more about that mode. 
Because if you look at this, you see that x1 does a lot more, has a lot more contribution to that eigenvector over here. And for this one, you can see that x2 has a lot more contribution to that eigenvector and that eigenvalue, therefore. Okay? So therefore, I only, so far we only looked at the eigenvector, eigenvalues. But if I plot now the eigenvectors and see who is more dominant on that eigenvalue or on that eigenvector, I can now say which states contribute to that eigenvector more than compared to some others. And then I, I, I'm going back from the modes to the actual states, okay? We only looked at the modes and we said there's oscillation stuff like that, but we never really connected them to the states, except I was showing with my hand, you know, it's doing that and this, but we never saw the numbers. Is it actually doing that? So we need to look at the eigenvalues and then compare which one is larger than the other one, which state contributes more to that eigenvector. And then we can say, oh, that state is, has more contribution to that eigenvalue and therefore to that oscillation or to the halving time, whatever. Does that make sense? Is that okay? All right, so that's what we are trying to do. And um, so I'm not going to calculate the eigenvectors here now, but I'm just going to write you what someone would find if you would do the eigenvectors for those matrices. Because if you want to now compare these states, listen, if you want to compare the contribution of these states, you would need to non-dimensionalize the variables that you, you know, for that, oh, where is it? Let's, let's look at the, figure, the, the, the longitudinal one, right? We have these things. This is a velocity, right? Feet per second. This is a velocity, feet per second. Q is radians per second. And this is theta, it's like radians. So how do you compare, make such a comparison for radians to feet per second? I mean, radi feet per second will always win, I guarantee you, right? Okay, so in order to make that comparison, you first need to non-dimensionalize them with, let's say, a maximum speed, maximum theta, or some, some level, whatever. You know, you need to non-dimensionalize them so that they become comparable, all right? So assume that you non-dimensionalize everything, including what's in the A matrix, and therefore you have non-dimensional numbers over here. Here I have a 32. You know where that is coming from, right? We have the G, we have the Earth acceleration the, 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 in the last piece here, remember? So you're comparing there's 32, there's 0, 0.0 and so on and so forth. So you need to non-dimensionalize everything so that you can compare. Now, assume you non-dimensionalized, non-dimensionalize, all states, all states, obtain A matrix and look at eigenvectors. And look at eigenvectors. You would obtain the following result. I'm putting a cap for non-dimensional, okay? W hat, Q hat, theta hat. This is for the figoid mode. This is for the short period mode. Okay? And we are going to just right now the Right, the magnitudes for all of them. So if you would write this down, so if you would write that vector for this, for this lambda 1 or lambda 2, whatever, for the phigoid mode, you would find this. 0 0.62, 0 0.0306, 0 0.0012, and this is 1. And here you would find 0 0.029, 1.08, 0, 0, 1, 7, and you have a 1.
Okay? Don't worry about the numbers too much because now they are, now they are non-dimensional, they don't really mean much. What we really want to do is we want to compare them now. Okay, that's a comparison. So if you make that comparison, you immediately see that the angles are the largest, of course, because this is angle and these are rates. I mean, the rates, they have to be an order of magnitude smaller than the, than, the, than the angles. So this is one. But you also see that here the velocity is really has a large contribution. Delta U has a large contribution, you see. I mean, compared to uh, the angle of attack, this is 10 times more. I mean, it's actually 20 times more yeah, than the angle of attack. So there's a large change in uh, delta U, in the velocity, in the figuit mode. The oscillation that we see, the slow oscillation in the figuit mode is really in the velocity. Look at the short periods. Well, of course, the angle is larger than the rates, but you have a really large one here, the W. That's the angle of attack. So the oscillation in the short period is obviously very strong in the angle of attack. So we here we see small changes in W hat, which really represents the angle of attack for us, but large changes in delta u, which is basically the forward velocity in the body x direction, right? So the oscillation, if you go it more, look up here real quick. I keep showing you this, but that's not really exactly true. The airplane's oscillation, oh sorry. The airplane's oscillation in the figoid mode is not really that, you see? I mean, there is theta, of course, right? You have a little bit of that, so it's not really a very false um, representation. However, a large change is really in use, so you're slowing down, going faster, slowing down, going faster, you know, that kind of thing. But on this side, the large change is in W. You know, the one that dies out very quickly in angle of attack. In small changes in Q and del U. So the velocity change here is not much. And this was dying out very fast, remember? And this part, the short period mode was dying out rather fast. But most of the change is in angle of attack, so it would probably be doing something like that, you know, a large change in angle of attack. But it doesn't mean that there's nothing happening on the other variables. I mean, look at this here. I mean, it doesn't mean that there's no change in angle of attack. It, it, it is there, it is small. And the big contributor here is delta u. Okay. So why is this exactly happening from a physical point of view? I know you're now trying to think, okay, uh, uh, angle of attack, there's lift because we're going to slow down. How is this now happening? You know, the physical understanding of this, uh, we will see if <coughs> starting next week, we will look at the physics of this. I mean, we, this is from a system dynamics point of view. But starting next week, we will actually look at forces and moments, lift, drag, and all these things. And then these, I will go back to these things and say, remember this, you know, we found from a system dynamics point of view, and uh, we'll go back to this. But this is kind of, do you understand what I'm trying to do here? Okay. I mean, do you have any questions? So, let me do the same thing for, yes. Yeah. Theta is a pitch angle, but this is, um, these are rates, right? This is radians per second, feet per second, these are rates. This is just the angle. So if you had an angle like this, okay, it's a large angle, and you already have a large number for that angle. But if you're doing, and, and think of Q, for example. You start with a Q, and then if you stop, Q is zero. However, you still have a lot of theta. So when you compare a rate with an angle, this will always win because of the large magnitude. Okay? So of course there will be theta, but comparing these ones is not necessarily the best thing to do. Okay? I'm not saying we shouldn't be including this, but I'm just making you aware that 
the rates will always be smaller. Understand? I mean, you're looking at uh, an, a contribution of an angle to an oscillation versus the angular rate, the contribution of the angular rate to the oscillation. So the angle will always be large and small, and there it will be larger than the rate. Does that make sense? All right, let's do the similar thing for the lateral dynamics. Okay, now as you note here, I have changed this a little bit. Um, I have now three angles here. Now we can compare angles. You see? Now we can compare angles. I have three angles here. This is the side slip. Instead of V, I wrote beta. I have phi and I included psi and I have R and P. Now the reason I have now the angles is I really want to compare the angles for a reason, okay? In, the, in this case. So let me write down what, the, what this spiral mode looks like. Okay, now if you would just compare the angles, right? I didn't want to go, I would not compare the angles with the rates, but I can compare the rates within, and then I can compare these ones. This makes a lot of sense because we have now the side slip, we have the roll angle, we have the psi, you know, that kind of approach. So if you look at these things, you can see that the psi in the, in the spiral is, is obviously a much higher than these angles. So the side slip angle and the phi, and the roll angle. So this one here, if you just compare the angles, psi is really high. If you look up, up here, the roll would be the one. And this is a, these are, of course, arranged such that they become ones, I mean, the angles. And the Dutch roll, I mean, this is, the roll, roll is still high, but you can see that this is not very little either, you see, I mean, compared to this one. This is one, this is 100 times smaller, this is, this is again much, two orders of magnitude smaller. Here you have this one, but this is 10 times smaller, but there's still some phi, but the side slip is very small. But here you have one, but you have a significant side slip and a significant psi. Okay? Comparing the rates, you will see that here you have a little bit of all of them. Um, and, and with a large P, right, with a large roll, the roll is quite large, I and mean, you can see it here, right? They're kind of compared over here. Same thing over here, the roll is large, so this is quite large as well. So you have this kind of behavior 
the whole time. So what we can conclude over here that the spiral is mostly in, mostly in Psi. So, and I told you, the spiral mode is more like this, where you have the airplane and the airplane starts doing that kind of motion. Right? So that's kind of the spiral. When you look here, it's mostly in phi. So you look at an airplane, so that's your roll angle, right? So it's, it's a roll angle. And here, it, it is, is kind of all states are involved with a strong roll, meaning that this strong roll. And this would be a motion that would more look like, you know, this kind of motion where the, where the airplane would be doing this kind of motion. Okay, well, so why am I showing this? I'm, I'm showing this so that you, you see when I say the spiral mode is mostly in the yaw axis that you understand where this is coming from. I mean, again, mathematically, if you do the eigenvectors, you, you will see that compared to the side slip and the roll that psi will be the stronger factor in this whole thing. So therefore, we can say that this is the yaw, this is the roll, and the dash roll has sort of everything. Now, for a lot of airplanes, you know, if you go into a spiral, and if it is an unstable spiral, which means you go faster and faster around this thing, it's sometimes very difficult to get out of the spiral for pilots, and pilots train this. Because if, I mean, you don't want to obviously get into this spiral mode where you start turning and turning and turning. And for this airplane, first of all, it is a stable situation, so this, you will get out of the spiral if you don't touch anything, according to our calculations at least. But if you had an unstable spiral and you would go faster, if you wait long enough and you go faster and faster, it's difficult to get out, even for a pilot. So pilots, you know, if you have a small airplane, they train this. And if you cannot get out of the spiral, there are lots of tricks to get out of that. You need to change something. The controls are not effective enough. So sometimes the pilots, they just open the window, uh, not the, open the window, the door of the small airplane. Or sometimes the landing gear is opened to change the aerodynamic situation in order to get out of the spiral. And sometimes people just cannot get out of the spiral at all. Right? It's a dangerous situation. If it's, you have an unstable spiral and you're really fast in there, Difficult to get out. Okay, so any questions to those modes? So we have, we, have, we have five modes. Two of them are in the longitudinal, three of them are in the lateral dynamics. And you have to really understand what these modes are and you have to understand really uh, their behavior. Because if you're, if, you, if you're in aerospace and you work with fixed wings, this is, this is kind of, um, these are very fundamental, key elements of flight mechanics, of dynamic behavior of an airplane or in, in fixed wing. Okay? So we have really one little topic left here regarding these modes. And uh, I will just, let me just give you an introduction uh, in the next, uh, uh, for, the, for the remaining few minutes. And I will probably do it next week real quick. And that is the following fact. Now look at this. If you have this matrix, now we can look at the eigenvalues, eigenvectors, and things like that. All right? But this is obviously not easy to get. So if I, if I design an airplane and I want to know about the phygoid mode, short period mode, then there's a lot of stuff involved in order to get those numbers. But in literature, we have 
quite nice approximations in order to estimate some of those modes, for example. Okay? And I will just give you the phigoid mode approximation it is because it is a, uh, just as an example, the phigoid mode approximation, and I, I won't do the rest. Um, but they are available in books. Okay? An approximation for the short period, an approximation for uh, spiral and things like that. So the phigoid mode approximation So you don't really need the whole thing. So what do you do with the phigoid mode approximation? Well, here's the approach. I mean, if you make these approximations, okay, here's the approach. Since there's a lot of change in del u, right, and there's some change in w, what we can say is, and uh, large change here, and then some change in del w, we can say, let's use the force equations, force equations along the body x and z, z direction. And further, assume w is approximately equal to 0, theta is approximately equal to 0, zq and zw dot are small. So if you do that, you get a pretty good phigoid approximation. So basically, we are saying the phigoid mode is mostly affected by delta u. Therefore, I need to include my delta u equation. Delta u dot must be in my equation. Okay? With the approximations I mentioned above. So we are, I'm taking the del u dot equation, right? I'm taking the classic del u dot equation, I'm, I'm, I'm equating this one. And the other approximation that I have is del w dot, right? And we are saying this is approximately equal to zero because it is so small, right? And we say this is z u m del u plus u zero times q. And we are continuing saying that z u is equal to m del u plus u zero times delta theta dot. Again, another approximation here because phi is zero, psi is not moving and all this, yeah, right? Theta is equal to zero, so q, if, if phi is equal to zero, then theta is equal to that. So we are only looking at the phigoid mode. Phi is approximately equal to zero, therefore I can say this, okay? So, making all these assumptions, I have something really small. I, I, I meet this really nice two equations. So I have delta theta dot. Take delta, delta theta dot, put it to the other side, and you get this nice approximation here. Del u dot, del theta dot is equal to, we're almost done, so hang on for a little more, uh, minus that u, u zero m, minus g theta del u del theta. And as you noticed, we have a second order approximation here, right? It's a second order system. This is a second order system. And what we usually get from here is we get a complex eigenvalue from this approximation. And this approximation is nice enough for us to find the phigoid mode. Why am I claiming this is the phigoid mode? Because I'm making the approximations that I found from the phigoid mode. One of the approximations is that I need to include the del u dot. I need to include the w dot. However, the w dot is small and w is equal to zero. 
make that approximation. This is not a bad approximation for the phugoid mode. And all you now need to find really is del x u, del x del u, right? Del x del u. And you need to find z u, which is del z del u. Now, how difficult are these to find? The, the good thing is that it is the change of the x velocity and the x force, I'm sorry, the aeropropulsive x force as a function of u. When I change the forward velocity u, who is changing in the aerodynamic, in terms of the aerodynamic forces and moments? What will change? The drag, right? So if I approximate x with drag and z with lift, suddenly I immediately can find numbers for these things rather easy. I would say this is del drag del v, u being close to the forward velocity. And this one would be del lift del v. Now these things we can do, right? Because then this one would be equal to, the drag one would be equal to 1 over 2 minus, of course, it's in the opposite direction, rho v square cd s divided by del v. And this one would be equal to del minus 1 over 2 because they're in the opposite direction, del v square cl s divided by del v. Right? So this one here then, you could say x u is, is equal to minus rho u0 s c d and z u would be equal to minus rho u0 s c l. Okay? And all you need to know is now CD and CL for your airplane. And you have an approximation for your phygoid mode. Okay? You need CD, CL, you need U0, forward flight, you need mass, and you need rho, of course. And you have an approximation for phygoid mode without going into this A matrix. Isn't that great? But you, you see what approximations I made. And you can make similar approximations to other modes without going really into the A matrix. But the real thing is the A matrix, right? So, please go back and remember what we have done for this class, because I think this was an imp important lecture this week. And I will give you a homework. It's time for a new homework. All right? So see you next week. <laughs>